Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask Concussion Doc. My guest today is Dr. John Letty, who is a professor of clinical orthopedics and rehabilitation sciences at the University of Buffalo, Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. He is a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine, the AMSSM, and of the American College of Physicians and Director of Outcomes Research for the Department of Orthopedics. He is a Division I team physician and medical director at the University at Buffalo Concussion Management Clinic. He is a member of the expert panel for the Berlin Fifth International Consensus Conference on Concussion in Sport. And in conjunction with Dr. Barry Willer, he was part of the development of the famous Buffalo Concussion treadmill test. So anyone who's listened to my podcast over the years has definitely heard of the Buffalo concussion treadmill test. Uh, Dr. Letty, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure, Cam. Nice to see you again. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm glad we were able to link up and sorry about the timing issue there, but um, I want to try and get uh, a bit of a background just for the, the impetus around exercise um, and how, you know, you guys kind of stumbled into this and, you know, made this kind of the de facto now, you know, number one treatment for concussion. We, you know, especially in the world of rest, rest, rest and telling patients not to do anything and you needed brain rest. What was it about exercise or what in the literature kind of led you guys down this path originally to think about exercise for concussion? Yeah. Um, you know, really, it really goes back to the um, late 1990s and early 2000s, Cam, when um, the treatment for concussion, as you as you alluded to, was uh, kind of strict breast until your symptoms went away. The thinking back then was, if you did something that aggravated the symptoms after concussion, you were harming the brain and you know delaying recovery, causing the concussion to get worse. Um, now, as you know, you know probably. 70 or 80 percent of athletes will get better from a concussion within 10 days, two weeks, three weeks. Um, so I, and 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 maybe sometimes a little longer for adolescents, a little shorter for college athletes. But there, there's an important minority that does not get better um, if they just sort of do nothing. Um, and that's, you know, again, depending on the study, anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of them. So, you know, if you're taking care of um, a team, or a college uh, with a bunch of teams, you can expect about a third of your athletes, you know, to still have trouble with persistent symptoms if um, they're just sort of told to go home and rest, you know, wait till all symptoms go away. The other part about that is, you know, adolescents and, and people in college are never symptom-free with life. You know, uh, nobody's symptom-free uh, on most days of any week, especially a teenager or a college student who isn't sleeping well, who's, you know, partying and things like that, and, uh, or exercising, you know, everybody's feeling a little tired or dizzy or, or a headache or irritable. Anyway, back when I was taking care of the, the football players and all the athletes at UB, um, I just noticed that for uh, some of these uh, guys and gals, uh, telling them to just continue to rest was actually, I thought, making them worse. It was not making them better. Um, now I'm a sports medicine. I'm an internal medicine physician by training, but I did a sports medicine fellowship in the early '90s. And as part of that, I learned how to do um, cardiovascular treadmill testing for people with uh, cardiac complaints, things like that. And then when I first went back to the University of Buffalo, I was doing um, a lot of um, exercise physiology research with the physiology department there, which is a world famous department. Um, and so I was, I was dealing with athletes and physiology and cardiovascular testing and things like that all the time. And so with Dr. Willer, who is actually Canadian, right? He's, uh, he's a Canadian who lives in Fort Erie, right? And, but has been a professor at UB for over, I think, 45 years now. Um, he, he is um, very well known in more severe brain injury circles. You know, he's a, he's a, a traumatic brain injury expert who's been working in that field for a while. But back in the late 90s, the Canadian Hockey Association asked him to um, develop some return to play guidelines for concussion. They didn't have any back then, really, you know. And he didn't know much about concussion, uh, I don't think, because he was dealing more with severe brain injury. So he came down to sports medicine and he asked, you know, is anyone interested in 
and working on this with me. And I said, yeah, I am. Cause I see these a lot. And then we started talking about it. And then, you know, I said, you know, some of these athletes are just not getting better with, with doing nothing. And uh, this is kind of weird because in sports medicine, the whole, the whole, um, the whole purpose of being a sports medicine doctor is to identify the problem specifically very early on and institute early active treatment. For example, for a knee injury or a shoulder injury or a spine injury. And with concussion, we were doing the opposite. We were telling these guys and gals to just rest. Don't do anything that increases your symptoms, including you know cognitive activity, social activity. Don't do any exercise. Um, until your, your symptoms go away. And so I, I thought, and Dr. Willis, there's got to be a better way. Um, we know people with more severe in, brain injuries would actually get rehabilitated with, with exercise, like strokes and things like that. So I said, why don't we use a cardiovascular approach uh, to brain injury and identify a safe level for athletes to exercise at, and then give them uh, a prescription below the point where their symptoms went up, much like they do in cardiac rehab. Mm. So if you have somebody who's had a heart attack, you know, after the acute period, they go on a treadmill and then they, they get their heart rate up um, either to where they're tired or they, you know, start to get some symptoms and then the cardiac rehab person stops them and then they, they do exercise below that level. So we decided to do that for the brain. And I searched the literature and I found a cardiac treadmill test that was very safe. Um, you could use it after a heart attack. And again, back then, this was, this was very uh, against the grain. So we had, to be, we had to make sure it was safe to do because again, this was not considered to be um, uh, optimal treatment, let's, let's say. So uh, I found this Balky protocol, B-A-L-K-E is the name, and uh, we started doing it, but not in patients acutely after the concussion. These were patients like these athletes who had been symptomatic for weeks and months. And, you know, we initially had just had a case series of patients, but uh, we, we pretty quickly realized that uh, by getting them moving, uh, you know, at this sub, sub-symptom threshold level, um, th they started getting better. Uh, pretty noticeably um you know a lot of that could have been psychological because they hadn't you know been engaging in any kind of exercise you know were, were separated from their teams and, and friends things like that but again getting an athlete moving again uh, goal oriented um has got to be good so in those with persistent symptoms we found that this was very effective especially again in athletes college athletes at, at getting them back to to play then I, um, because of my training, I started thinking, um, well, exercise uh, really is dependent upon the autonomic nervous system uh, part of your brain, because that's what's controlling heart rate, blood pressure, ventilation, um, uh, you know, the control of all that. And um, so I thought, well, maybe, maybe this, uh, maybe there's autonomic dysfunction after concussion. Maybe that's why they can't exercise very well. And maybe, maybe exercise is working because it's, it's sort of, sort of restoring uh, control to this autonomic nervous system. Uh, now that was just a theory in the beginning. Um, and we published a paper, I think in 2007 about that dysautonomia after concussion. But in subsequent years, we did uh, some experiments and so have others, many others. Uh, to show that autonomic dysfunction is a cardinal manifestation of concussion. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, mm -hmm. And probably it really has relevance, Cam, to athletes because um, training gives you uh, good autonomic function, very, very uh, responsive, you know, controlled, um, uh, balanced autonomic function. That's one, of the that's one of the advantages of being an athlete and being fit. And it's probably one of the reasons that fit people have lower rates of heart disease and depression and uh, um, uh, all-cause mor mortality as well. That's one of the reasons. So um, uh, that's why we decided to use exercise. Initially, we were uh, identifying uh, their symptom threshold on the treadmill and using 80% of that heart rate that they got to. And then that was, that was their training heart rate. And we would progress it you know, every couple of days or every week. Uh, if they were getting better. In the past several years, we've been using 90% uh, 
of the heart rate threshold that they get on the test to be their initial training heart rate. And we, we progress it because we're starting to realize that the more you do early on in terms of this type of approach, the faster you recover. So I think uh, the amount of exercise does matter. And how hard was it initially to even get through like an ethics approval process for the initial studies? I know that you, when you do a case series, you don't necessarily have to do that. You're kind of saying, I have an idea, let's try it out. But for your initial trials, was it a challenge to try and even get approval to even do that? Because the, the thought, even back, I, I remember when, when this stuff first started coming out, um, chatting with some of the people up here, kind of in the, in, in the concussion space, some of the older guys, and they were still on the train of like, no, rest, 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 rest. Um, so I'm just wondering like how hard it was to try and move that needle for those initial trials, even to allow you to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 in the beginning, it was kind of difficult. Uh, you know, we had, uh, we had again the, these um, these case series data, and we had shown, and we published one or two papers, if I recall, um, showing that at least in the people that were not in that uh, acute phase of injury in the first week or two, that we could do this and um, do it safely. Um, but, so again, the first studies we really looked at were in patients with prolonged symptoms. Um, and it, it was challenging. You know, we had to, I remember having to go to a meeting in person, which generally you don't need to do uh, when you submit an IRB, but, you know, this was kind of novel. So I, you know, I went and made my case. Um, and then by the time um, we, got, uh, we got an NIH grant, um, to look at the physiology of concussion, even in adolescence, you know, early on, um, it, it was, I think because of our earlier success, uh, it was, uh, it was easier than to, to ask to do this in the early phase, um, you know, within the, within the first 10 days of concussion. Now that, that would have been very, very difficult to ask for right away if we hadn't shown that it worked, um, uh, and was safe in patients with prolonged symptoms. So yeah, th there were some challenges. Um, I think though we, uh, in retrospect, went about it the right way. Had we decided right off the bat to to try exercise, you know, in the first week after concussion in an adolescent, I think they would have said, "Forget it. You have to, <laughs> you know, you have to show first that this is safe in an, in an adult and somebody who has sort of prolonged symptoms." But ha having done that, we we then were able to um, get the IR our, the our ethics board to. Um, approve an NIH trial in uh, within uh, 10 days of injury. Mm -hmm. And then uh, because we got that, then we were abs uh, actually able to do two randomized trials of exercise in that in th that very same time frame in adolescence, you know, from 13 to 17 years old. Um, but you're right. And, um, you know, <laughs> I would present this stuff at meetings and, and stuff. And, uh, you know, people would be skeptical that it was, that it was safe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I don't think they are anymore. We've, we've done, you know, thousands of patients now we've published on hundreds and hundreds of kids and we haven't had one, not one, uh, adverse event. Yeah. Um, you know, you can get a temp, you can get temporary symptom exacerbation with the exercise but you can get temporary symptom exacerbation with almost anything after concussion. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, you know, part of the, part of the education process of this is that I, you know, we realized, and I'm sure you have that mild symptom exacerbation after concussion is not detrimental. Um, I mean, it's, it's, you don't necessarily want to promote it, <laughs> but um, as long as they don't push into, you know, moderately severe, severe symptoms, they all recover. Um, mm. uh, you know, and, and certainly can resume whatever intervention they're doing the, the next day uh, with no adverse effects. And you could even argue that, you know, all the, you know, all the papers that are coming out in the last couple of years, uh, every one of them shows that early activity or early exercise is beneficial to recover, concussion recovery. Not one has shown that it isn't, not one. Mm -hmm. And so 
you could argue that mild symptom exacerbation activity, whether that's exercise or cognitive, is actually beneficial uh, to healing the brain, much like moving your knee after a knee injury hurts, mm -hmm. but it actually speeds your recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm totally on board with that. And I would actually, I'm I'm totally on the camp of I think we need mild symptom exacerbation. A, it shows you where, you know, problem issues may be. So for example, if it's exercise and getting up to a level, it shows, hey, I'm intolerant to this to some degree. And so I know it's a problem area that needs to be worked on. Nope. Um, and I think you can say the same thing of cognitive loading or, you know, crowds and visual motion and all these other things. You kind of have to challenge yourself a little bit and, you know, don't go overboard. And the, kind of the way I, I describe it is, and similar to, I've, I've applied the treadmill testing model to a variety of different conditions, whether it be cognitive loading or not, it's, you know, you got to find out where your line is. And if you're, if you're scared of your line and you're not going to go to where that line is, for example, if you're going to exercise, but you don't want to do too much and you're just going to hang out down here, that line will get closer and closer to you where less and less activation will actually start to set you off because you're becoming avoidant of all sorts of activity. So the line, it, you know, being so afraid of crossing the line, actually that line starts getting closer to you where minimal things flare you up. So I always make the argument of like, we got to find out where your line is. And then we just got to get up and just kind of just surpass it a bit to know where it is. And then maybe hang out below it for a bit and then challenge it every week or two. Yep. to see. And I do that with cognitive. I do that with vestibular. I do that with motion. I do that. I tell people to go to grocery stores and do a few laps if they're having visual motion issues. And right. it's kind of like the symptoms are the treatment, find out what flares you up and then go and do that and gradually increase that in, in, in a very systematic way. Um, and yeah. I think that's, yeah. it's completely counter to what, you know, we used to do telling people to rest for months and months on end and do nothing. And, and I just, I'm just thinking about like, man, that must've been such an uphill battle initially, at least to get people to buy into the idea of the exact thing that we've been avoiding is the potential cure here, or at least a very valid treatment, you know, and it started with people that are three, six months out. And now we're almost to the point. And, you know, this, I want to get your take on where we're going from here. But your recent trials within 10 days, I think the the average day of starting was around day four or day four and a half or something, I think, on average for those RCTs. Yeah, day five to six. Yeah, right. And the reduction in persistent symptoms in the exercise group was close to 50 percent, 48 percent, I think it was. Yeah, in the recent trial. So uh, and the range was two to 10 days. So we were doing this in some folks as, as soon as two days after their injury, you know, sometimes two, three, but the mean was four to five, I think, or five to six, sorry. Yeah, so in the second trial, um, we had more clinics and we had more patients who had persistent symptoms, but that gave us a chance to see if early exercise actually reduced the incidence of persistent symptoms. In the first trial published in 2019, uh, we only had a few subjects go on to persistent symptoms. So to statistically, you couldn't you couldn't show an effect of exercise versus placebo stretching. But in the mm -hmm. second trial, we had more because we had more severely injured uh, concussion patients. They were more symptomatic. And we, we in fact found that, you know, if you do this early on, then you reduced that incidence of symptoms beyond 30 days by 50%, essentially. Um, which again, I, I was very gratified to see that, Cam, because um, in the in the first trial, we improved recovery by I think a median of four or five days in the, in the aerobic exercise group versus the stretching group, um, and that's good. I mean that's fine, um, but those were you know there weren't that many of the kids who went on to persistent symptoms, and it's that group that's really the problem, mm -hmm. especially in in adolescents because. Um, they are missing seasons of play and, and sometimes weeks of school or, you know, they're, they're really having trouble with um, keeping up in school and uh, keeping up with their friends. So their quality of life really suffers if their symptoms are, are lasting beyond a month. And it was gratifying to see that early exercise, uh, you know, that only mildly exacerbates their symptoms, actually reduced that by half. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the most important, I think, outcome of the recent uh, trial. We got a grant from the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine to, to do that trial. And um, 
you know, even though we got stopped early by COVID, mm. we still had enough power to find that, you know, had COVID not come along, we would have had, you know, 30 or 40 more subjects and really been able to uh, show it, but we, we still did. And um, so we were a little lucky there with the timing in one way. I mean, COVID, COVID just shut down uh, sport concussion research, but we were almost, we were mostly through it by the time COVID really hit. From a, from a clinical standpoint, I know that trials are different, but from a clinical standpoint, do you see this as something that day one, day two, we should be putting people on the treadmill? Like, I mean, at, at, at our clinics, our policy now is, is if, you know, basically at day five, whether you like it or not, you're going on a treadmill. So between day five and seven, just because that was the mean of of the, of the subjects that were, were in that, we're in that RCT around that date. Yeah. Um, now, do you think that there's enough evidence that we can, you know, safely push that to day two, or even on the initial evaluation, even like patients coming in concussion was yesterday. All right, get you on the treadmill. Let's start, you know, or do you think yeah. day five is, is a good place now? Just well, clinic, clinically. Yeah. 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 It, it, you know, it really depends. I think for younger adolescents, you know, and I de I'll define that as 15 and below, um, probably that's a little aggressive. Uh, you know, I think they more than likely need that two days of relative rest, uh, not going to school. You know, if, if someone has a concussion on a Sunday or during the week, um, I don't think they should go to school the next day. There's just no value in doing that. It, it really increases their symptoms and they probably need to take two days off. But after mm -hmm. that, okay, after that, they have to be getting back into school and things like that. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't typically see most kids in that, in that first two days. You know, it takes them a little while to get in, you know, or they go to their they might go to the ER first or their primary care doctor first. So again, uh, the fastest I can generally get people in uh, is, is, you know, by five days, six days, seven days, sometimes four days, occasionally two. Again, we, we did that a few times, but that's the exception. Mm. Um, so in a 15 year old and below, um, I, I, again, I don't think in the first two days, they should be doing a whole lot. They shouldn't be, you know, hiding under their, their covers in a dark room, but they shouldn't, <laughs> you know, they should just be kind of going around the house, going for a walk outside, maybe texting their friends is fine, but not playing video games. And we know that minimizing, we know that from Rebecca Mannix's work now, that minimizing screen time in the first 48 hours is actually very effective. Mm -hmm. So that's something that, again, it's generally an ER um, intervention because that's who's coming in uh, in the first few hours, the first day they're going to be seen in the ER. They're typically not seen in a concussion clinic in the first mm -hmm. day. But if they minimize screen time over that first 48 hours, that is absolutely helpful in, in uh, preventing prolonged recovery. And then, um, so again, in, in, a, in, in, a, in an older adolescent or a college athlete, say you're seeing them on day three and their symptoms are, you know, their symptom severity scores in the high 20s or the low 30s and they're getting better and their physical exam's pretty good. I have no trouble putting that person on a treadmill that day, okay? But that's for like 16 and above and college athletes. Yeah, right? elite level. They, you know, they will tolerate um, this better than the younger ones or the younger adolescents. <clears throat> and again, as long as you use the stopping criteria during the treadmill test, it's, it's safe to do it and safe to start. So uh, for elite athletes, Cam, for college athletes, you know, division, in the United States, we call them division one athletes, but almost all college athletes are pretty elite mm -hmm. and pros. Uh, we are doing this. Yeah. The day after concussion provided their resting symptoms aren't widely, you know, uh, you know, wildly high. That is if their resting symptom visual analog score on a, on a scale of one to 10 is um, uh, seven or seven out of 10 or less. Uh, and they want to try the treadmill test. We will do it. If, if they don't want to try it, if it's seven, eight, nine, and, uh, you know, at a 10 and they're really symptomatic, then we'll wait. Um, but if they're at, you know, barely a seven, or they're at six, five, four, three, you know, at a 10 below at rest and, um, uh, you know, not, not having increasing headache or anything like that, they, they had their concussion, they had symptoms the day before, but now they're kind of stable, they're feeling better, not normal, but better. 
uh, you can do this test in those athletes because um, elite athletes are different physiologically mm -hmm. than, than sedentary people and non-elite athletes. So it really depends on your population. Again, I'll, I'll just reiterate, younger adolescents, 15 and below, I, I tend to wait till day, you know, at least day three, four, five, six, depending when I see them. I give them that first two days really to kind of recover, but not strict rest, just relative rest. Just mm -hmm. no, you know, no, no significant cognitive activities like going to school and no significant exercise, just kind of walking around and, and minimizing screen use is useful. Um, but after that 48 hours, uh, you can you can do it um, as long as their symptoms are stabilizing and you follow the stopping criteria. And in the older, older adolescent, right, 16, 17 and above, 18 into college, um, you know, if you happen to get them the day after or two days after, and again, they are um, having m minimum, mild to moderate symptoms at rest, not severe, but mild to moderate, then you can do the test. Uh, as long as you stop them when their uh, symptom score goes up by a change of three versus baseline. Mm. And I know that there was um, there was some talk, you know, a couple of years ago about, about the treadmill test as as somewhat of a biomarker for for concussion. Are you still of of that mindset and using that clinically or for for research purposes of of trying to kind of validate that as as a biomarker for concussion? Yeah, um, I call it a physiological biomarker. Uh, you don't need to draw blood, put them in an MRI or get saliva. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we're putting together a paper cam on the sensitivity and specificity of exertion testing for diagnosing concussion. Uh, not just the treadmill test, but the bike test and other tests out there in the literature. Other people have used other types of bike tests, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know that in, at least with the Buffalo concussion treadmill test and bike test, um, our sensitivity and specificity is going to be probably in the mid nineties, uh, mm. I would guess. I, you know, I don't know, uh, what the other, uh, this, what, this is going to be a systematic review uh, of all these different exertion tests in the first week after concussion. And you have to have, uh, not just concussed patients, but also some controls to look at sensitivity and specific, well, specificity for sure, because mm -hmm. you want to know who doesn't have it as well, uh, exercise intolerance. So, um, but uh, I don't have the results of that yet. We're still putting it together. But I suspect the sensitivity uh, for con for diagnosing concussion and the specificity will both be pretty good and above 90% for sure. Um, whether it's up near that really high standard of 95, I'm, I'm not entirely sure yet, but I think it's gonna be pretty good. Um, and if you look at the biomarker studies, yeah, you know, if you combine a bunch of different tests, you can you can get above to that you, you can get that area under the curve, uh, you know, approaching 0 0.9, 0 0.95. Mm -hmm. um, but for any individual one of them, most of them are low below that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I know you need you need some equipment to do it. Uh, although we have developed a step test and a march in place test, mm. uh, where you need almost no equipment. We've developed that for the military, and um, so I think this this principle of exercise intolerance early after concussion is a very good one for if you're not sure as a clinician, you know, and sometimes you're not, you know, mm -hmm. is this a concussion? Is it a migraine headache? Is it a neck injury? Is it some combination? If they're exercise intolerant, then that pushes your pretest probability of concussion, in my mind, significantly higher. Mm -hmm. If they're if they have a good exercise test. Then I think I I must I, I better look for something else to to uh, explain their symptoms because I it's probably not a, a concussion. This is probably getting a little bit into the into the weeds on on some stuff, but I mean my biggest problem with all the biomarker studies is that we don't have a gold standard. So how to confirm you know how do we confirm diagnosis? Um, I mean most people use clinical diagnosis, but that's, that's then assuming that the clinical diagnosis is hundred percent accurate. Right. Um, so how are you thinking about that from, from this perspective? You know what I mean? Like I just, yeah, yeah. No, that, it's, that, 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 yeah, it's a legitimate concern. I, and I don't have a good answer for you, Cam. I mean, the only, the only thing I can say is that the gold standard right now is the diagnosis by someone who's experienced with concussions. So someone like you or in, in, in our clinic here in Buffalo, if, if the clinician comes out and says, I think 
Johnny is concussed here, uh, that, you know, they're probably right. Um, mm -hmm. If that's done in some family doctor's office who sees one concussion a year, I'm not dissing family doctors. I love them. But uh, you have to have some experience with concussion um, before you're comfortable making the diagnosis. So um, right now, you're, you're correct. There is no gold standard to compare these things to. Uh, again, we would uh, say that exertional testing is, is um, going to confirm your, your, your pretest probability of disease in a sense. Um, but the gold standard right now in my clinic is, is you know, me or one of my colleagues making the diagnosis based upon the history, the physical, um, and that, and that's important, you know, doing, doing the physical, because the physical gives you a lot of clues, uh, you know, if there's a concomitant neck injury, right, you know that, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, looking at vestibular function, ocular motor function, uh, balance, things like that. All those are so common after concussion, those also, those abnormalities raise the pretest probability. So if I have someone who comes in a week later and um, complaining of symptoms and, you know, hit their head or whip and whiplash their neck and their physical exam is completely normal, I'm, again, I'm questioning whether this was a concussion or is it already gone? Mm -hmm. Now, then I would use a treadmill test to see. And if that person sail through the treadmill test just fine, normal physical. My diagnosis is either one, um, this is a concussion that's better by now, and that happens, mm -hmm. uh, or two, it's not a concussion. What else What else was it? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it was just a neck injury. Yeah. You know, the symptoms are very similar. So um, again, as someone who's experienced at diagnosing concussion right now is the gold standard. Um, but we don't have an objective, you know, uh, uh, imaging study, blood study, saliva study to, to tell you, yeah, you're right. That's, you know, that's, that's what it is. I, I don't know if we ever will, frankly. Mm. Um, I think much as you probably know, it's going to be some combination of subjective symptoms and more objective testing, mm -hmm. like, um, like the physical exam, like exertional testing, like maybe a, a you know, an easy to, to obtain a biomarker or something, you know, that you can get a salivary sample or, or a drop of blood. Uh, although, again, I, I, I would think that those in isolation will never be sufficient. They may help you raise your pretest probability, but you're always going to have to use a multidisciplinary uh, approach to this because a concussion affects so many parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on the blood biomarkers, there's all sorts of issues with, you know, concentrations and timelines from injury and when do we draw the blood and which markers do we look for? And so, I mean, it's, it's funny, like the media portrayal of this versus the reality of the situation. It seems like every other day I have people sending me articles about a new blood test for a concussion. And I'm just kind of like, well, <laughs> there's, there's some challenges. I'm, I know that, you know, people are working on it very hard and, and yeah. I hope that someday we'll be able to get there. It'd be nice to have that problem solved, you know? And I think essentially at this point, it's like throwing the kitchen sink at it and trying to develop some sort of, um, you right. know, gold standard to say, okay, these tests seem to be pretty accurate and confirming things. They all tend to tell us the same thing. I think we can use this, um, you know, group of things together to, to confirm uh, diagnosis. And then that becomes de facto. And then we start building on top of that. Um, so I think it's a, it's a definitely a long, a long process. Well, I think, I think biomarkers can will, will not be too useful in making the diagnosis, but they may be useful for prognosis. Uh, that is, you know, some of these biomarkers, depending on when you get them, if you get them a week later and they're still abnormal, that may have prognostic value for uh, time to recovery. But I, I find it very difficult to believe that a biomarker is going to improve on, I, there's no way it'll improve on someone who has experienced diagnosing concussion because they've seen a lot of concussion patients. They, there's just no way, uh, for example, you and I don't need a biomarker to tell us when someone's concussed in 99% of the cases. Right. Now, you know, a pediatrician out in Alberta, um, might benefit from that kind of a thing if he or she, you know, never sees concussions or, you know, is, is uh, not sure what to do. But I would argue that teaching them a good physical and history and maybe a simple exertion test would, would do far more to improve concussion diagnosis and management than 
having them have to get a blood test. Yeah. I, the only, the only benefit I see from, from the biomarker standpoint is, is more like insurance claim compensation. Um, you know, the, the psychosomatic PCS patient that, you know, may have not had a concussion at all. Um, and just being being able to alleviate some of that, um, good point, you know, upfront, I, I think that's really the value. Um, now, I wanted to kind of talk just about exercise and exercise prescription in terms of the the treadmill test and the and and the value of the treadmill test. Personally, I feel that the treadmill test is key for determining exercise level. I know that there's some people out there that are just hearing that exercise is beneficial and they're just sending their patients to go and exercise. It seems to me to be very willy-nilly and in my experience I've seen so many patients that they heard that exercise was good. They tried exercising, but every time they exercise, they have a setback and they, and they can't function for three days. And my immediate thought is, well, that's because you're, you're, you're pushing through your line every day. And that's, that's just, you're just, you're just holding yourself back. You're not allowing yourself to progress. So I want to get your take on the importance and the value of the treadmill test versus just exercise in general, or, you know, telling somebody just to kind of go or what kind of protocol you might use for somebody who doesn't have access to a treadmill test. Um, I mean, I think this is a bit of a loaded question at this point, but um, over to you. Well, yeah, I, you, you're absolutely right that if you don't give athletes parameters, they often exceed them and then they get symptom exacerbation. So I've, I've seen that many times myself. Um, and that's the value of identifying each individual specific threshold because they all are, are all different. Mm-hmm. Um, so without, without guidelines, athletes don't know what their threshold is and they will exceed it. You're absolutely right. The other, the other part of that, although it's not as common, is that if they, they again, if they don't have a guideline or a, a heart rate to go at, they may exercise way too little and not get any effect. So um, you, you need to give them specific parameters. The best is to, to assess each individual's level of tolerance on some type of exertion test and give them a percentage of that. Again, uh, that point where they get their symptom exacerbation, we stop it and we record the heart rate and we give them 90% of that. And then we progress it again, you know, by five beats per minute every few days if they're doing okay, for, uh, for example. Now, we, we published a paper in 2020 where we, we gave the reader three ways to, to do this, one of which was, or, you know, one of which was that without a treadmill test, without a, a bike or any kind of exertion test. And what we did was we just, um, and, and the, the paper includes a form or a link to a form that allows the patient to start off at 50% of age predicted maximum heart rate, and then progress very systematically. And you can fill in, you know, your heart rate and your progression each day. And, and the key, the key to the way to do that is they, they really need to have a heart rate monitor of some kind, you know, a watch or a strap. But if they start out exercising, let's say at 50 or 55% of maximum, that heart rate, we then give them a little scale. If your symptoms went up by zero or one point, then you can move to the next phase, which is to increase by 5%. Um, so then, and you can do that the next day. You can go to the higher heart rate the next day. If your symptoms went up by two, uh, then you stay at that level for another day, let's say, and then try it again. If your symptoms went up by three or more points, however, then you're going to go back to the prior level uh, where, you know, now for the first stage, that usually isn't necessary, but as they're going through this, if they get to a stage and their symptoms go by three, four points, what we're telling them is then go back to the stage before where you didn't have that increase try that again and then and then go back and try the the next level so we use the the degree of symptom exacerbation to guide their progression through um, through the, the levels of exercise now this is not as good as you know identifying their threshold on a, an exertion test but it allows them to use their degree of symptom exacerbation on each uh, during each exercise bout to then either stay the same or progress to the next bout or go back to the prior one for a day and then try again. So it's a systematic way that gives them, you know, parameters to, to uh, work with them. And, and that's how athletes will, will do the best. Um, so it's, it's a way to do it. Uh, is it as good as, again, you know, the treadmill or the bike? Uh, no. Um, but it, it, it avoids that 
problem you identified of people just going out and, and doing way too much and having a setback because it it it, it guides their exercise progression along uh, according to the degree of symptom exacerbation. Those looking for that paper, it's uh, Bez Herano. Yep. Is that, is that, did I say that right? 2020 Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine, Practical Management, Prescribing Subsymptom Threshold Exercise for Sports Related Concussion in the Outpatient Setting. We use that. We have a virtual care program and we, we use that exact protocol. Uh, and it seems to do uh, pretty, pretty well um, for our patients. Uh, but it, I find it just takes them longer to try yep. and establish, you know, so it's just a little more time consuming to try and get to a level. And also, I think that there's, you know, just, you know, not being there with the patient. If sometimes, you know, when I start a treadmill test, for example, I'll have a patient be like, I feel like a slight tingle and they have all these kind of really mild symptoms and, and, um, you know, being on your own, sometimes they'll have a little bit of, you know, we'll call it kinesiophobia and, um, you know, they may, they may pull back a little prematurely on that. So for anyone looking for that paper, um, it's a good read because they have the other options in there for not having a heart rate monitor, I think was another one of the options that was, that there was, yeah, um, right. You can, you know, another, another way to do this, not as good as to go by rating of perceived exertion, you know, um, uh, you know, don't, you know, exercise to the point where, you know, you, you can, um, you're, you're breathing, but you can still carry on a conversation, things like that. But, but those are not as good as uh, identifying everybody's threshold. But mm -hmm. I, you know, like you, I realize not everybody can do that. Um, certainly primary care providers, you know, probably don't have that facility. Although, you know, the way to do it for them is to find a trainer or a therapist or a physical, a physio who, um, who can do the, do it for them, who can do mm -hmm. the test, do the prescription you know, most, most of the tests are not being done by doctors or chiropractors, I don't think. I think they're being done by athletic trainers in the U.S., athletic therapists in Canada, uh, physiotherapists, um, exercise physiologists. Yeah. Yeah. Our clinics um, up here, about 30 to 40 percent of all the patients we see are referred directly from their from their GPs. So um, generally, right. GP sees them. Uh, and then sends them to us for treadmill testing and and any vestibular and anything else that needs to be done. Um, our clinics mostly handle kind of the rehab uh, point. So yeah. it works well in that yeah. sense because it's it's a good relationship. The doctor just sends them over. They don't have to worry about actually administering, but they get all the information passed back to them to uh, to you know be involved in the care. So that works that works pretty well. Um, we do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I have a couple technical questions here from from some from some CCMI people. I put this out on our Facebook group, and um, just asked. I said I'm interviewing you, and uh, asked if they had any questions. So, first question comes actually from she's a um, an RN pediatric RN in uh, in in the U.S. and she had this question. She saw you speak at a conference, I guess, recently. Uh, she said historically we talk about decreases in blood flow, and recently some studies have found increases. Um, and I just added in same with kind of glycolysis. We have like this hypo then transitioning to hyper glycolysis after how do you think about blood flow or do you think about it more as an ANS disruption, like autonomic disruption, where it's not necessarily blood flow being up or down, but more so altered in terms of, in terms of, you know, global blood flow. Right. So, um, uh, the, so there's a strong relationship between autonomic nervous system function and cerebral blood flow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's largely under the control of that system and, and ventilation with carbon dioxide. So, um, and, and studies have shown uh, both increases in cerebral blood flow after concussion and reductions. It, it, it kind of depends on the population being studied and when they obtain, you know, the images. Okay. And whether or not they're resting, doing a cognitive task, or doing some sort of exercise, uh, you know, some sort of physical exertion. So, if you're confused by the cerebral blood flow literature, uh, welcome to the club because it's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the way I think about it is that there's there's a dysautonomia after concussion. That's a spectrum of of injury from from very mild, let's say, orthostatic intolerance, all the way up to something called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome which is a severe dysautonomia. But in, in between that is where most people lie. And um, what, what many, you know, several studies have shown is that if you have, say, increased cerebral blood flow a, a couple of weeks to a month after 
um, your concussion on a on an MRI, let's say, those people tend to have prolonged post concussion symptoms, prolonged recoveries. Um, it, uh, and what what we've shown, at least in one study, is that if you measure cerebral blood flow during exercise, um, uh, this was a, a study in females. We found that um, it was higher uh, during exercise than it needed to be. Uh, at least compared with controls and compared with them when they were recovered. And what does that mean? Well, it means you've lost your, your ability to auto-regulate blood flow control to your brain during exercise. So when you start to exercise and as you, as you go up in intensity, your cardiac output, the amount of blood pumping to your muscles and brain goes up by a factor of almost five. The brain blood flow during exercise goes up by about 20, 30%. So a fraction of that. Why is that? Because you can't fill your head up with blood. It'll explode. Or you'll get a <laughs> headache. It'll start coming out of your ears. So, um, so cerebral autoregulation is very important. And if, if it's off even by a little bit, as, as it is after concussion, and you start to exercise, you literally get too much blood flowing to your brain. And that's why you get a headache, we think, and dizziness. And others have shown this, OK? Mm. Headache. Uh, has been associated with the, the Harvard group has shown that headache is associated with the degree of cerebral blood flow velocity on, on a bike after concussion, things like that. So um, the point is, is that cerebral blood flow and cerebral autoregulation are disturbed after concussion. There are both increases and reductions to different parts of the brain um, that you can see depending on how you measure it, whether that's by transcranial Doppler or arterial spin labeling on an MRI um, or functional MRI. And it, it just, uh, don't, uh, don't get too caught up on whether it's up or down, it's just wrong. Mm. Uh, and I think of it, I try to make it simple because that's how I am. I can't get too complicated about this. I, I think that it's too high when you're exercising in those first few weeks and that's why you get symptoms, but it's probably too low at rest which is why you may be fatigued and having trouble concentrating uh, and things like that. So it's, it's just off for a while. It's probably that cerebral blood flow problem is probably worse in females than males because females have much more variable cerebral blood flow, it turns out, than males do. That's likely for um, evolutionary reproductive reasons, things like that. Um, so uh, it's an important part of concussion physiology. And you know, there are several studies now showing that when people are quote unquote clinically recovered, their cerebral blood flow is still not normal. Mm -hmm. um, there are studies now, many studies now showing that, you know, again, upon recovery or six months later, your DTI images are still not normal. Mm -hmm. um, we published a study last year or the year before showing that autonomic function in people who had a concussion more than a year ago is still not normal, um, but they're living their lives without symptoms. So this tells me that the, the part of the healing process to concussion is, is more adaptation in a way than what we would probably conceive as, as healing back to normal. It's uh, the brain, you know, the brain is very good at, at rerouting um, pathways and, and blood flow and, and, and neurotransmitters and things like that. So it, it adapts to its new sort of normal. Uh, and in most instances, people don't don't feel it. You know, they feel recovered. They're back to playing sports and not having headaches and being able to concentrate. But when you look at the physiology, um, it's it's still not quite normal or back to baseline. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a, kind of a fascinating thing. And you know, does that relate to vulnerability to for, further concussions? Does that relate to the risk of neurodegenerative disease down the line? Um, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, developing vascular disease later in life. I mean, nobody really knows that. Um, but it's pretty clear that concussion leaves, uh, in, in many instances, a permanent imprint on the brain. Uh, but, but the consequences of that, nobody really understands yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's how, how I've been thinking about it. Not, ne not necessarily focusing on increase or decrease blood flow, but just dysregulation of blood flow, right. um, you know, poor, poor adaptation, 
um, with, with exercise, your, your, your autonomic systems, uh, auto regulation systems, n- neurovascular coupling systems, et cetera, are just not responding the right way. And so you could see all sorts of different alterations. Um, and so I look at it more autonomic now on the, um, it was interesting that the, the, the segue, cause the next question is on POTS um, and you already kind of briefly touched on what that is, but um, this question um, came from one of another clinician actually in the U S who's in uh, just outside of Phoenix area, but he asked, what are your thoughts on managing POTS in a concussed patient? I don't know how much uh, POTS care you do, or if you refer that on, or if, if you tackle that, but just difference in concussion POTS versus um, standard POTS. And I don't know if you saw recently, there was an article that just came out um, I think it was last month looking at the difference between um, POTS in, um, you know, kind of let's call it the normal kind of, um, you know, young female population POTS versus concussed POTS. Did you see that that paper? I did not. What what journal was that? I'd like to see it. Um, I can't remember what what journal is. I can send it to you, though. It, it just it just came out last month. I can't remember what journal it was. Uh, and I'm trying to remember who the author was. Um, but anyway, they they found that. um, um POTS cases, just in terms of who it was affecting, it was affecting males and females equally in the uh, post-concussion-based POTS. They attributed actually a lot of it to uh, to kind of like disuse and and inactivity because once they started getting people exercising and doing things, it it tended to help. Mm -hmm. And it was also it was also highly correlated with symptoms. So the higher the symptom severity, the more likelihood they were to have POTS. But it was something like seven to ten percent of adolescents after a concussion were experiencing, um, you know, diagnosis pots on mm. on uh, active standing test yeah. Yeah. Um, um, anyway so just wondering you know a do you do you treat pots patients um, and and if you do do you have any differences in how you would treat a concussion pots versus a standard pots right. patient? okay so I don't treat standard pots patients but I have seen two two things I've seen patients develop pots after concussion and I've seen pots patients get concussed mm-hmm um so uh and and we've been interested in in orthostatic intolerance for a while so uh what's a a fairly common um again sort of subjective objective physical sign symptom after a concussion is that if someone stands up from supine they feel lightheaded or dizzy more often lightheaded because that's a cerebral blood flow problem dizziness would be more of a vestibular problem right um uh, and we published a paper a year or two ago uh, in in 270 subjects or something and showed that um, I think f- uh, 50% of people had orthostatic intolerance in that first week um, when they were concussed. And when they recovered, it went back to control levels, which was about 4%. What we found was that these patients almost invariably had symptoms when they stood up after two minutes of supine rest, but they didn't uh, their vital signs change, but typically not enough to qualify as POTS or for uh, blood pressure criteria for orthostatic hypotension. That is, they had the symptoms, but without the profound change in vital signs. And I think this is because their dysregulated brain uh, can't h- handle even smaller changes in blood pressure or perfusion than, mm-hmm. you, know, than you know someone with POTS could. So um, the good news was that that improved as they improved. But there are some people who develop this persistent dysautonomia that fulfill criteria for POTS. Um, Those people after a concussion um, take longer to recover because remember you're you're sort of, well, let's go back to what I said first. People who have POTS and get concussed, that's a terrible combination because Mm -hmm. they're, they're, wildly symptomatic they are um, really impaired and they take a long long time months and months and months to recover the approach to them is very similar to the the typical patient with exercise intolerance but you you may not even be able to do a a treadmill test or a bike test on them because they're so intolerant or it may last a minute or two before they have to stop and you basically have to build them up from a resting heart rate very, very slowly in terms of um, exercise progression, you know, like five beats a month or five, well, not, that's, that's an exaggeration, five beats every two weeks or something. Um, or, you know, as, as soon as they can tolerate a little exercise, you go up by 
uh, you know, five beats uh, per minute and see if they can do that. And that's gonna take them a while to get used to. So you, you go up uh, and you do this progressive sub, sub threshold exercise, but very, very slowly, very gradually and be prepared for it to take uh, months and months, you know, mm -hmm. three months, four months, six months, literally to get mm -hmm. them back to where they were. Uh, so that's a that's a POS patient who gets concussed. The concussed patients who develop a dysautonomia that qualifies as POTS, you know, that I think is what you're alluding to, that 7% or so. They will respond faster to this approach, uh, although it's the same thing. You identify their level, which is going to be very low. Their, their sub-threshold uh, or their threshold for symptom exacerbation with uh, this kind of dysautonomia is going to be very low you know, in the, in the uh, hundreds, you know, mm -hmm. just above, uh, you know, uh, an extreme resting heart rate. So um, it's just that they, they're going to take longer to get better, but the only, you know, the best treatment for them is this, this, you know, regular progressive low level exercise, uh, you know, building up slowly as they, they get more tolerant. Sometimes, you know, we have them wear compression stockings sometimes. Sometimes, you know, the people with real pots are usually taking some sort of volume expander like Florinef. Uh, you know, those those types of treatments have to be used in people with pots beforehand. Um, it, it may have to be used in someone who develops concussion pots. Although, again, my experience is that it's not as severe as the true pots patient. Um, but it, it, it definitely happens. I, I'd appreciate you sending me that uh, paper because I, I haven't seen really a good, uh, there are a few papers on POTS after concussion, but they're really kind of case observations. Um, this is uh, the, the head author here is Rachel Pearson, but it's Chris Giza's group out of UCLA. And, okay. and um, retrospective review of 268 patients, they said that uh, orthostatic tolerance testing is, is part of every single clinical evaluation. And so they grabbed it and they found that 7% of their population, which was eight to 25 years old, exhibited post-concussive orthostatic tachycardia. And they were, they differentiated it from POTS. They called it post-concussive uh, orthostatic tachycardia. Um, and they found that the only significant difference between those two groups was a history of prior concussion uh, was more prevalent. So people with previous, maybe autonomic dysregulation yep. from, their, from previous concussion injuries, which makes sense to what you were saying. Um, and, uh, it says, uh, the conclusion here, just in the abstract, while POTS literature describes female and adolescent predominance, post-concussion OT, ortho orthostatic tachycardia had similar prevalence across age and gender groups in this study, suggesting that it may be distinct from POTS. Uh, yeah. but I will, I will send it to you. It's in child neurology open. Um, and it was just, uh, just this, this past month, it was, that it, it was published. Yeah. Thanks. That's, I, I'm going to read that. Cause that, that's, that's pretty interesting. I like the distinction because it is a different, um, syndrome okay. i think then yeah then, and that's and that's i think what what this question you know is getting at do you uh do you you know worry about hydration and and salt intake and um you know do you do you start them exercising in a supine position yep um yeah okay you do yep. that's that's the other thing i was going to say they they really have to start off with a a, a recumbent bike that's mm. the best way to to retrain them that's how we do it Nice. You test them on the bike and then we have them train on a recumbent bike in a gym or something like that. Right. That's the best way to do it. Yep. Um, again, the, the volume expansion and stuff like that really depends on just how symptomatic they are during the day. Um, I think in the post-concussive, that would be unusual in, in typical pots there. Many of them are on that stuff or need to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, another one on ANS dysfunction, obviously, I guess you're the, you're the guy for that. So this is good. Uh, this one is, um, I think I know the answer because I think we've kind of touched on it. So uh, you can be as brief as you want here. So can symptoms from untreated autonomic nervous system dysfunction from previous concussion thought to have recovered, uh, but likely potentially masked or compensated, can they reemerge after minor non-concussive or whiplash injuries years after the initial TBI? If so, how frequently does he observe this? <laughs> um, well, it's hard to answer because... I, I think the answer is yes, it can happen. Uh, the hard part is how frequently. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, it's an interesting question. Um, and I, I, I don't have a, I can't really comment on the frequency of that. I mean, you know, I, I see people who have a concussion now and they had one, you know, five years ago or eight years ago. Um, do those people more often have orthostatic intolerance or autonomic symptoms than people who didn't have a prior concussion? I don't know. Um, 
it's an intriguing question. I, I don't know if it's even ever been asked or answered. Um, but I, I think it's entirely possible. Like mm -hmm. I said, if you start to measure autonomic function and multiple aspects of it, whether it's um, uh, to sensory stimuli or, or phys phys physical stimuli, uh, patients who've had concussions in the past have abnormal responses. So it's entirely reasonable to think that if they get another concussion, their autonomic uh, symptoms and, and function would be worse mm -hmm. uh, this time. So um, I, again, it's it's an intriguing question. I don't I don't know if we have the data to look at it, but mm -hmm. um, I, I I could certainly believe that would happen. Um, and if you're seeing that, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised by it. Uh, yeah. I mean, the way that I think about it anyway, and I know this isn't really data driven, but just thinking about concussion as a reflection and how you recover from concussion as a reflection of, you know, almost your pre-injury state, I think going in in, in in many ways, if you already have chronic systemic inflammatory issues, then you're likely to be dealing with some issues. If you have prior mental health issues, you're likely to be dealing with some issues. If you already have a dysregulated autonomic nervous system from either previous injury, uh, you know, loads of stress, physical and mental on your body, you know, whatever it may be, you, you get a concussion injury, which is, it does all these things as well. You're likely to just be a little bit behind the eight ball. So if you already have a dysregulated nervous system, even having, uh, you know, a few stressful life events can start to probably bring back some of your concussion like symptoms. Right. And so, um, yep. I mean, that's, that's what I've just seen you know, with, with some patients. And so I think you're, I think you're right on that. Um, I want to be mindful of your time and, um, and I, I really appreciate you kind of joining me today. Just any, any follow-up thoughts, things you guys are working on, things you're excited about um, coming down the pipeline. You mentioned a couple of papers you were working on right now, things we can look forward to. Yeah. Um, we just got one accepted at medicine and science and sports and exercise showing that um, if you adhere to the exercise prescription, you know those those kids in the in the recent RCT that really did their uh, exercise like we asked them to do or did more than we asked they recovered faster and it wasn't related to you know it wasn't only the kids that felt pretty good after the concussion who did the exercise one of the criticisms we faced is that well the only ones doing the exercise are the ones who feel good enough to do it turns out in this data set. The, the kids who had the higher symptoms and the more physical examination abnormalities did the exercise better and recovered faster. Hmm. So uh, that that eliminates that that criticism in my mind. It's just not the ones who are feeling good enough to exercise who do it. In fact, it's probably the ones who feel kind of crummy and they you know they're motivated to, to try something that they think will work. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it does. What you do in that first week really matters. And if you do more of it. Again, paying attention to stopping if your symptoms go up, uh, it looks like you recover even better, even if you have more symptoms, more physical exam findings. So, uh, and then we're another paper that should be coming out is is about those physical signs. Again, the ocular motor vestibular signs. Again, if you have more of those, you probably have a more severe concussion. And it turns out that early exercise helps you even more if you have uh, more of these physical signs of concussion than less. Hmm. So, you know, the, th the thinking was maybe exercises only help in the mild concussions, but we're finding that that's not true, that it helps the ones that are more severe, even, even better. Mm -hmm. If, if you started early, you know, in that first week and, uh, they stick to it, you know, they, they actually, uh, follow the, the prescription, uh, well, um, and then we're looking at, you know, the differential effect of exercise on emotional versus cognitive symptoms, things like that, um, uh, we're doing uh, uh, some on, on visual aspects like accommodation and the KD test. We're working on that. Um, so there, there's a few things uh, coming out. Um, and we're trying to get a, uh, we're waiting to hear if we got a, a grant from the DOD to do this in, in soldiers. So we'll, we'll see if, uh, I, think, I think soldiers could recover faster if they do this earlier on too. Mm -hmm. so, I, would, so. I would bet money on it. <laughs> we got to get it. Though. We got to get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would, I would, I would definitely bet money on it. Um, are you going to Amsterdam? I am. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to be on the uh, on the consensus panel again? Yeah, I'm leading the systematic review on rest and exercise after uh, concussion. So, uh, yep, I'll be on on the panel leading that review with some real good uh, colleagues, and um, 
looking forward to that because you know it was supposed to be two years ago in paris and covid covid killed it so mm-hmm. uh, yeah i think there's there's a lot of uh a lot of stuff that's come out in the past you know five six years that uh it's going to be interesting to see kind of how that all comes together so i mean yep. I, obviously it's like it's like christmas for me uh waiting for that to kind of all come out so i'm i'm, I'm excited as well so all right, Dr. Letty. One more, one more thing, Cam. I, I, I recently reviewed a paper for a chiropractic journal mm. written by a chiropractor and a physician that uh, me- meant to um, alert chiropractors to what they can do to treat concussion. I thought it was very good. I think it'll get published. I think it was in Chiropractic and Manual Therapy. Is that, mm. is that a journal you guys yep. have yep. anyway? Yeah. I think that'll be coming out in the next few months. So, um, uh, so look for that. Yeah, I will. I will. Thank you for... Uh helping the chiropractic profession to get some papers published on this topic. So, yeah, yeah no, no worries. Uh, all right, Dr. Letty, um, thank you very much for your time today. And um, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate it. You're welcome, Cam. It was fun. Good questions and a uh, pleasure to talk to you. Take care. Yeah, cheers. 